Um, my name is Sergei Kelchik, and I teach in the departments of History and Germanic and Slavic Studies here at the University of Victoria. I'm originally from Ukraine, and I received my doctorate from the University of Alberta in Edmonton. I'm a historian of 19th and 20th century Ukraine. I also do some work on contemporary 21st century Ukraine. It's my great pleasure today um, to be talking about my recent book, which is entitled The Conflict in Ukraine, from the Oxford University Press in paperback in 2015. It was a project which I decided to prioritize over other ones um, and to make it appear quickly in order to uh, make the Western audience aware of what exactly was happening in Ukraine during 2014 and 2015, of what is in fact still happening in Ukraine as we speak. This is because the proposed title by the press was uh, The Crisis in Ukraine. And I am aware that uh, by now at least two books have appeared in English with that same title, The Crisis in Ukraine. I have felt, however, from the very beginning that there is an implication here of the Ukrainians being blamed for what was happening to them. The crisis, Ukrainians are responsible, somehow the crisis needs to be resolved. And that, of course, left outside of the picture major international forces, one of them Russia, very much present in the Ukrainian conflict. So I've asked the press, and I was very happy that they agreed, to change the title to The Conflict in Ukraine. And that, of course, already had an implication of an international development, of an actual war, of something not necessarily co caused by Ukrainians. And that is what I liked, because my, my explanation from the very beginning in this book is that we should not forget, we should never forget about the international dimension of this crisis. Uh, we can do everything in Ukraine and still the war would be going on. Because what caused the war in the first place was the Russian involvement, was the Russian absorption of Crimea, was the Russian sponsorship uh, of separatist rebels, and the direct involvement of Russian citizens and Russian armed forces in the conflict. If it were not for that, nothing would be going on now uh, in eastern Ukraine and southeastern Ukraine. So that's one big point which I'm trying to make in the book. Uh, you cannot solve the Ukrainian crisis in Ukraine. It has to be solved on an international scene because it should be considered in line with such developments as Syria, with such developments as the Russian occupation of parts of Georgia, the Republic of Georgia. It is, in other words, a global competition between Russia and the West, the competition which Russia is clearly losing and yet is determined to go on in it. Uh, and that, in fact, is the major reason of the war in Ukraine. The other reason, I'm, uh, the, the other reason is, of course, uh, political within Ukraine. And that is namely the long rule of President Yanukovych, before that Prime Minister Yanukovych, before that President Yanukovych, and before that again Prime Minister Yanukovych, and his Donetsk clan, which oriented itself towards Russia. It's not, however, the geopolitical orientation that matters. Most people would assume that that was the revolution against the Russian orientation. That's not the case, actually. It is just that Russia stood as the most important, most recognizable symbol of something, symbol of something which was also happening in Ukraine, namely a corrupt authoritarian regime trying to establish itself as a domineering political force. That was the moment, really, when Yanukovych was overthrown, when he wanted to become more like Putin. So it is actually, uh, Russia stands here as a symbol of what Yanukovych wanted to make of Ukraine, a fully dominated, exploited land run by oligarchs, run in a way which resembles neighboring Russia. Not necessarily rule, ruled from Russia. I think he would have objected to that. But, of course, the Russian force is such that they had the ability to manipulate him over his objections as well. Why is that important for understanding the conflict? Well, the significance here is in the fact that uh, Yanukovych and others like him wanted to go through elections every now and then in order to ensure uh, 
the political division of Ukraine. You see, the elections time was the best opportunity for Yanukovych and other pro-Russian politicians to actually manipulate the people by introducing the notions that would be very cheap for them to implement, or perhaps not even implement, such as the notion of the Russian language. It's much easier to mobilize some senior electorate in the East around the notion of allowing the Russian language some administrative rights. It's much more difficult to reform the pension and benefit system for the entire Ukraine and for those very same confused senior citizens. So, of course, Yanukovych, just like others before him, like President Kuchma, we remember very well in 1994, used the card of the Russian language because it was so cheap for him to use. That would result in considerable public outcry, that would result in court cases, but it would not result definitely in the need to stop the extreme corruption, the exploitation, the milking off of the Ukrainian economy, the transfer of state uh, assets into the possession of the president and his family and, and friends. So there was an inconvenient cover in these linguistic issues and also historical issues, covering up something very important, what was going on back then, and to some degree actually continues to go in Ukraine, the domination of oligarchs, which generates protest vote among ordinary Ukrainians. So, it was then a system which produced a situation uh, which made it possible for Russia to intervene and also make it, made it possible for Russia to present it as a civil war, which it is not. Also, if you look at the definition of civil wars today, they are not understood the way Putin understands them, like an internal conflict of Ukrainians into which Russia is not involved. Most civil wars today, in fact, do involve a powerful outside actor, very often an actor in the neighborhood, but more often a great power or a country with a great power ambitions, which is what Russia is. So playing on this pre-existing contradictions and the pre-existing uh, manipulative strategy of Yanukovych's regime, Putin suddenly took over, dismissing his, his uh, flunkies in Ukraine and actually using the Russian army as a tool. I don't think anybody was prepared for that. And that, of course, is, in a major way, uh, a, a more contextualized explanation that you would normally encounter in the Western media. Like so many colleagues in the West, um, I get to do the interviews with the media, which usually start with the question, so what are Ukrainians up to? And of course, it's not up to the Ukrainians to end the war. Um, it's it's just the issue which is not resolved in the Ukrainian capital. It can be resolved in other capitals of the world and can be resolved by putting more pressure on Russia too. Actually, I think Timothy Snyder, when he wrote the endorsement for the book, which is on the back uh, of the uh, cover, it says something like that. When you are flying into Ukraine, when you are a Western observer or a banker or policymaker flying into Ukraine, this is what you should put on, on your uh, tray table on your flight. And uh, I, I usually resist the metaphor of airport books, which people grab from the shelf at the last moment to entertain themselves. But this is the case when I am not offended at all. I actually like to present it this way because it is designed, it is designed to be an airport book, something like, um, you know, a, a collection of questions. And when you pick up the question which does resonate with you, but you know very little about Ukraine, for instance, that would be a perfect opportunity to look at it before they start serving the drinks and then move to the next question after the drinks as well. Uh, so that, that was the structure of this series. And this series actually uh, is a very long one by now. It includes titles on a variety of things. And Oxford is quite successful in, um, um, in advertising it, and for libraries in particular. Yeah, there are various reasons for that. Uh, actually, there is a legal reason on the Ukrainian side why the Ukrainian state does not do that. Um, and there are, in fact, various course cases, uh, co court cases in particular, um, when people are classified as deserts from Ukrainian army, their lawyers argue that there is no war going on according to Ukrainian legislation. Ukraine never declared that this is a war. And the Ukrainian state still is trying to evade uh, the use of this term, 
uh, because once you declare this um, as a legal term, then the International Monetary Fund would not be able to work with Ukraine. And there are certain international organizations they would have to withdraw from Ukraine because according to, char- to the charters, uh, they cannot operate in a state which is at war. Uh, and this assistance, some of it actually humanitarian assistance, uh, International Monetary Fund provides funding for important structural reforms. It is crucial. But there is, I think, another reason. And this is the reason I'm increasingly thinking about it now. I actually just organized another conference on the war in Ukraine last weekend. Um, and retroactively, retrospectively, we now see that there was a moment, a very clear moment, when the so-called volunteers, the so-called Cossacks, and all these strange types, uh, retired Russian intelligence officers with mental issues and such, when they became supplemented by what can unambiguously be called an invasion, when the actual regular Russian army units move across the border. And this moment happens uh, in in the summer of uh, 2014. What I find fascinating is this, with our current state of intelligence gathering, there's all the satellites flying above, which can allegedly read the license plate plate of your car, Right, um, there was no immediate and clear, unambiguous announcement from from the great powers of the world that you know our satellites see uh, the massive movement of Russian troops, which then immediately resulted in serious encirclements and defeats for the Ukrainian army. So that moment, that moment. Also, everybody talked about about Russia being behind the scene. Nobody really registered the moment and made a, an appropriate outcry about it. When the army army units moved in the summer of 2014 in large numbers, when they became the primary force, not the militia. And I have to say that in Ukraine, with very high unemployment rate among uh, young males, uh, and not just young males, actually, and especially in the Donbass region, it's not all that difficult to raise the militia. People have no work. This is a paycheck. Right? If it happens to coincide with the ideological convictions and what the Russian television says, even the better, better still. But it is a paycheck, and it's a very difficult economic situation, true. So, so the moment when the Russian army moved in in considerable numbers was not, in fact, registered on the radar of the, of the world media, or scholars for that matter. We find out retroactively, retrospectively, as Western agencies release the information about that, as we have lots of evidence from Russian soldiers posting on social network. The move into the Crimea alone justified the term invasion. Of course, Mr. Putin argued that they never exceeded the quota of, of the number of the maximum number of Russian um, servicemen in, on the uh, peninsula, which was set at 25,000, and apparently they didn't have that many. That is not the point. The point is, of course, that the servicemen were not supposed to take power in their own hands, right? Uh, But but there was a moment when I think Western democracies, in fact, played along with Mr. Putin by not using that language, not actually fixing the moment, not making it an issue in the United Nations and various organizations that yesterday or last week something really important happened in the Donbass. So that moment never came at the time. Uh, my own explanation for that is that Minsk negotiations and various other talks were going on behind the scene, um, and it was not to the benefit of the Ukrainian side uh, to escalate the war of words. But that resulted that resulted in, in scholars looking, looking back at the conflict and not seeing a clear trace of when exactly the Russian involvement happens. There are books already published by people especially in the UK, in fact, arguing that Russia was protecting its legal interests, that the Russian army was its, its, um, its um, a legitimate interest as a great power in the region, uh, that the Russian army was not really there, that it was volunteers, people basically continuing the Russian narrative, replicating the Russian narrative. And the big issue is here, and it's not just that the Sputnik TV and uh, uh, Russian television are available so widely in Europe, and so many Russian oligarchs own British newspapers, which publish uh, op-eds on, on this topic, but also that the alternative narrative was not, at the time, 
uh, sounding loud and clear. I think Ukraine actually uh, went a long way from that. Uh, through creation of uh, Euromaidan press, the crisis center, the press agents with the Ministry of Defense. Today, for instance, if you want to look at the map of the conflict or historical maps of the war in the Donbass, that would lead you straight uh, to the media crisis center in Ukraine. And you would also get them in English. And I would call this good work, good work on the Ukrainian side. It's a bit too late, really, in the game, because we should have cried for the in the summer of 2014 at that particular moment. But it always happened that President Poroshenko and his representatives were engaged in various negotiations. We know that the Western allies were sending signals to Ukraine all the time. Uh, It only came to light, um, let's see, more than two years after the fact, that when the Russian annexation of Crimea was happening, the Western allies contacted uh, directly the Ukrainian leadership, advising it not to take any action whatsoever. Even the token one, just, you know, just allowing uh, allowing a few hotheads to actually uh, actually resist and see what would happen if they resist. Uh, It was, in fact, the Western allies which dictated the Ukrainian line on the Crimea. Uh, There are now protocols published, the minutes of the Security Council in Ukraine, which make it very clear that uh, there was no... Uh, unanimous agreement among the Ukrainian leadership about how to proceed with the Crimea. They were waiting for the signals from the West. The signal from the West came clear and unambiguous. Uh, not, uh, do not fire a single shot. Uh, withdraw your troops, the ones which want to stay with you. Uh, leave everybody on the ground, whoever wants to be under Russia. That did happen, as far as we know. I'm not suggesting here, by the way, that Ukraine should have declared a full-scale war on Russia and attack. Russia at that particular moment. Politically, it was inexpedient. But it's actually curious that the Western signal came before the Ukrainian government even had a chance to discuss the situation. So I guess this is yet another illustration of my point that the conflict, the war, uh, is not a Ukrainian issue. It's a global issue. It's an issue of world politics in which uh, compromises can be made behind your back. Um, and Ukrainian politicians, uh, you know, they can be pitied for that. And can it, we feel sorry for them, too, because uh, there are certain things in which uh, this global dimension of this conflict is beyond their reach. Beyond their reach for now. For now. Um, but there are pluses, too. A small ones. One plus, for instance, that the active stage of fighting in Ukraine ended the very next day after Russia intervened in Syria. And that, by the way, is an excellent evidence of the Russian involvement. So all this uh, people trying to, 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 to deny the direct Russian involvement and to claim that Russia only uh, provides support, where it is in fact some kind of rebels who fight the war, should think twice about it, about the fact that Fighting on, on, on the um, uh, control line between the occupied territories in the Donetsk and Luhansk provinces and the Ukrainian side was rather intense until that moment in the fall when, when Russia suddenly intervenes in Syria. The intervention, as we know, was very sudden. It surprised the West. But that was also the moment when things suddenly became very quiet. And that seems obvious to any objective observer, a person sitting in front of his or her TV, suddenly the guns went silent. Why would that be? And of course, the only explanation you can possibly come up with is that that day Russia actually moved its attention to Syria. (laughs) And another interesting implication for those of us thinking about uh, strategy and political science would be that Russia is not a great power which can afford to be actively intervening on several fronts. That's actually an interesting one. And I wonder whether in the Western capitals there was due attention paid to that too. Right? Uh, that is, uh, it also indicates, of course, the Russian strategy. The Russian strategy of constantly surprising the West with new moves. Mr. Putin can afford it because he has been in charge of the Russian government for many, many years now, and he will likely be for some time um, so he, he actually can build a long-term continuity, this game of cat and mouse with the West, surprising them, even so, 
his abilities, his strategic might is incomparable. It's very small compared to the West. But by constantly shifting the strategic focus, moving from one conflict to the other, from Georgia to Ukraine, from Ukraine to Syria, who knows what is going to be next? There was apparently a high, a high power thing yesterday uh, it, between, between the Russian generals and North Korean generals. That I would yeah. love to be a you know a fly on the wall during that particular meeting. Of course, a fly with with, uh, with full access to what is being said as well. Um, very curious. So the, the strategy here is not to win over the West, but to gain advantage in a number of regional conflicts, which then translates into more domestic support for Putin, because his domestic audience has been pre-programmed really, to believe in the defense of great power status. There is a considerable opposition, of course. Every time there are elections, there are certain neighborhoods in Moscow that do not vote, and in and, and St. Petersburg and elsewhere, that do not vote the way Mr. Putin likes, but they have extensive mechanisms for, for fixing the vote and such. Uh, in other words, he also needs to be, uh, to, to be a warlike leader in order to continue his own base of support to keep it. And his own support in, in military and security apparatus, uh, in fact, would push him out if he were to go for a peaceful deal with the West. Not that Mr. Putin is interested. Well, first of all, I haven't read this text, or I haven't listened to that particular talk by Dr. Kuzio, which I would love to. But my own reading would be um, somewhat different. I could accept this interpretation if uh, we see the national not in a purely as sense but in a sense of um, notions of civil society that come embedded in a version of the nation. What I mean by this is the following. Um, consider, for instance, Galicia before the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Most of us would say that the national movement was very strong there. That would seem like an ethnic Ukrainian affair. But at the same time, it came complete with the development of notions of civic society, involvement, political participation. So that version, that version uh, of Austrian parliamentarism became embedded um, into, into Ukrainian politics, and it existed in this form until the early 1930s. Uh, it then came back at some point, and one could argue even that... Uh, that uh, some current political parties in Lviv continue that line of actually civil parliamentarism understood as a component of new Ukrainian nation building. Uh, that can also be said, in my opinion, of the war. In what sense? My book is uh, dedicated uh, to my mother-in-law, uh, who passed away during the war. Um, she was actually an ethnic Russian. Uh, my wife comes from an interesting family. Her dad is completely Ukrainian-speaking. He grew up speaking Ukrainian, going to Ukrainian school. Her mom is actually ethnic Russian. She didn't speak any Ukrainian at all uh, uh, until, until she went to college. So she died during the war, uh, but until the very last moment, she was watching television, and she was 100% on the Ukrainian side. Even so, she could barely speak the language. Um, and that kind of a personal example, which I see as representing a greater trend. It's well known that not all the defenders of Ukraine speak Ukrainian. There's so much footage, really. Um, opinion polls, I think, would be misleading on that, really. Uh, because, because opinion polls like referendums, re referenda in Ukraine, they always um, can position the responder in relation to what is expected of him or her. So when you, when you start polling these people, they would say, oh, no, 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 I'm completely Ukrainian, 100% Ukrainian. And that would lead certain social scientists to very <laughs> interesting conclusions. But once you look at the footage, and so many fighters, so many soldiers in the Ukrainian army carry smartphones, right, um, you realize immediately that at least as much Russian is spoken in the lines of the defenders of Ukraine as Ukrainian is spoken. So it's not... Purely, not only. And we do know about ethnic Russians. Actually, ethnic Russians from Russia fighting on the Ukrainian side. We know about Orthodox Jews fighting on the Ukrainian side. That would suggest to me a notion of political differences. 
political differences between the two uh, sides, the two belligerents, that are encoded in the language of the nation or the language of the empire on the Russian side, the language of Novorossiya, uh, the language of uh, Little Russia, you know, the language coming from the Tsarist times. Um, and in this, I think, I think something is, um, this encoding is actually not very complex. Uh, and once you start thinking about it, it uh, there are various examples to, to confirm it. For instance, for instance, uh, when asking about political preferences on, on both sides of the front, it becomes clear early on that Stalin is a big hero on the Russian side of the front and in Russia itself but not at all on the Ukrainian one. And that is not just about the Holodomor. This is about the model of the state which exists now. Of whether you see it as, as an authoritarian state headed by a strong leader, as a state which is a successor of, of the great powers during the 20th century, that is how Russia would like to position itself, then Stalin has to be a hero. And so he is. But also there is a component in this of the Soviet Empire, of the Soviet Union. That is why uh, the Lenin monuments are removed on the Ukrainian side, but not on the Russian one. Not because Mr. Putin likes Lenin. He hates Lenin. He, he made it obvious in public many times that his heroes are the white generals, the ones who wanted to save the empire against the Bolsheviks. He would go on and lay flowers on the graveside of General Denikin, who was, you know, who would be against the concept of independent Russia, who would be for uh, recreating the Russian Empire. So Lenin is not Putin's symbol, and yet it is a symbol of the Soviet Empire of the unity which some people could naively think of as a good Soviet thing, but which was fundamentally one way of um, instituting the Russian domination. And thus Lenin does become a Russian symbol against Mr. Putin's wishes. And that's why we have a, a wonderful situation in which, in which um, the supporters of Mr. Putin are protecting Lenin monuments. And when you read the Russian press, destroying the Lenin monument is something evil which can only possibly happen in Ukraine, but not in Russia. Why would that be? When Lenin, uh, Putin hates the revolution. He blames the existence of independent Ukraine on the revolution. Um, and of course, as we all know, the Ukrainian uh, filmmaker Oleg Sansov was um, uh, arrested in the, in the Crimea for allegedly an attempt to blow up the Lenin monument, which is the supreme irony of it. So when you want to imprison the enemy of the empire, you bring in Lenin, which otherwise is not needed in this scheme. So I think, in other words, that there is a lot of political difference here, which is connected to the notions of nation for sure, and the empire just as well. But uh, it's um, often expressed in the language of nationalism, but there is more embedded into it. There's a reason why our students here at the University of Victoria, they go back to Ukraine in the summer, they come, come back and start wearing embroidered shirts, and they become huge patriots of Ukraine. Why would that be? Not clearly, not because they can speak fluent Ukrainian or they in, in, intend to relocate to Ukraine or anything. Some of them have no familial connection at all. But I think they fall in love with the moment of popular sovereignty. They see how people in Kiev by and large, believe in the possibility of a democratic, um, independent, prosperous Ukraine, which is not there yet. Huh? So they can be disappointed, but they also believe in their own ability to change things. And this is very different from the experience students get when they go to Russia. And our Russian colleagues do send students to Russia as well. It's a very different experience in, in which the civil society is mostly silent, uh, in which you can be beaten up by the police on the street for trying to make a political statement, in which you can only protest one by one, and therefore photographs from Russia show us people holding posters. That's the only way, you know, if you stand by yourself holding the poster, that's the only way not to be charged. But even in that case, you will still be beaten up by the police. So, um, people feel that instinctively. If I were, uh, if I were a traditional... Ukrainian nationalist of the old days, I would actually be very happy with this. I never thought of 
political space as a concept, of urban space as a place of protest, of where would people would go by default if they wanted to express themselves politically. Uh, in the course of writing this book, it appeared to me that for some strange reason, Maidan became the political space, the national political scene of Ukraine. And yet, if you think about it, there is nothing there. It's only the Kiev municipal authorities building, which is nearby. Um, and, and, you know, that, that really bugged me. So I started looking back into history, and I'm a historian by training, so I love doing this, right? And, and it turns out, of course, that you can establish continuity with the immediate previous revolutions, like the Orange Revolution. But, of course, then the question appears, of why did they show up on the Maidan during the Orange Revolution and not at Verkhovna Rada? And then, <laughs> looking further back, there is the Revolution of Granite, when, when the students showed up with... with, with um, uh, with protests against the Ukrainian, the then Soviet Ukrainian authorities at the very high end of the Soviet period. Some of the students participated in other revolutions. Of course, the question is why the students showed up there in the last years of the Soviet Union. Well, because it turns out that what was standing in the middle of Maidan previously, before World War II, was the building of the city Duma the municipal authority, and in the absence of any other serious political places and any serious politics in the city, mass politics focused on the building of the Duma, the municipal council. It was actually a very ornate, very picturesque building with balcony from which political speeches were made. And so this building, which no longer exists, actually created the physical space of protest and also positioned the place, uh, the place for it between the building and the opposite, where the uh, Lenin Monument used to be, where the uh, Monument of Independence now is the Column of Independence. So this space was coded as a space of politics in 1905. In 1905, when people started protesting against the Tsarist regime, um, there were manifestations uh, against the Bolshevik rule in the 1920s, still. And, and and then, even so, the political authority moved elsewhere. There was a new uh, cabinet of ministers building, there was a new uh, Supreme Rada building in a di slightly different part of town. That stayed as the place. Maidan remained the place of politics because the Bolsheviks organized parades there and built the, built the parade reviewing stands there. So there is a very interesting historical tradition which makes people think, this is the national scene. When I want to speak to the nation, when I want to speak to the world, I go to Maidan. I don't necessarily go to Supreme Rada. Yeah? And there isn't really uh, much space uh, even so. Today, as you know, it seems that the opposition to President Poroshenko is actually trying to, uh, to put up the tents there, not on the Maidan itself. And I have to say that the Ukrainian authorities notice that too. They are not going to follow up in the steps of President Yanukovych and try to build a Christmas tree on the Maidan. They moved Christmas trees, they moved other, other um, 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 festivals and important state occasions to Sofiska Square in the upper part of town on the other side from Verkhovna Rada, which of course has a long tradition of religious celebrations, which of course um, has a tradition of the Ukrainian People's Republic and the Hetman Skoropadsky's monarchy organizing celebrations there. But it's also a, a physical space which is not as uh, ex uh, expandable, which is easier to control, easier to, easier to build the barriers to control who gets in. So I find it actually very interesting. Uh, Present-day Ukrainian authorities do not like it going to the Maidan. Uh, Oxford University Press is putting out the second edition of My History of Ukraine. Uh, the book which originally came out in 2007 appeared in five foreign languages since then. They are going to update that one, a more substantial account. And as I will be updating it, in the new edition, in the second edition, it will actually include a more, let's see, long-term analysis of the revolution of dignity and the war with Russia. Um, in part because the moment I stopped my narrative in, 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 in the small green book, as I call it, in the small green book, 
um, I did not yet know much about the policy of the new Ukrainian government. Uh, President Poroshenko just been elected back then. We had no clear vision of what his policies are going to be, what was going to happen to the economy, what would be the new um, uh, composition or structure of political forces in the parliament. Um, and perhaps above all, uh, what would be the Russian policy on Ukraine going forward? How would the Western allies position themselves? Would they be strong supporters or would they be kind of negotiating with Russia, trying to make to make a deal of sorts? These are the things that are not necessarily clear now. But what is clear now is that they are really decisive. I couldn't speak to them in, in the little green book. Uh, but I will, in the second edition of Ukraine, um, of the history of Ukraine, it's actually entitled a Birth of a Modern Nation, Ukraine Birth of a Modern Nation, which will be coming out in the second edition, hopefully in 2019, hopefully after presidential elections, when we will have a better idea of how successful Ukraine's economic transformations have been. And this whole issue of uh, association agreement with the European Union, which was the formal pretext, really a pretext, not the cause for the revolution, how did that one play out in the long run? Um, also, there was not yet a decision on visa-free travel for Ukrainians uh, to the Schengen zone of the European Union, which I think made a big difference. Uh, so it was probably intended an, as a consolation prize. We are not giving you any pass towards uh, accession to the European Union, but at least here is visa-free travel. Uh, how these things played out, how they influenced the Ukrainian politics, is actually, I think, very important for determining whether there is going to be another revolution, perhaps in the same physical space. Um, and they need to be analyzed as a longer trend. I know that great many people who would uh, listen to this broadcast, to this, uh, watch this video, would probably be very disappointed with President Poroshenko, as indeed I am as well. Uh, but, of course, we really, really need to look carefully at the line the West has been taken on Ukraine and the room for maneuver, if any, uh, they left for the Ukrainian authorities. I, I'd like the viewer to be aware that it is ongoing. I think most people uh, who travel to Ukraine, most people who read regularly about Ukraine are aware. But what they should probably do, and I do not insist that they do it with my book in the hand, they should probably grab a good account of contemporary Ukraine, focusing in particular on the war and not following the Russian line. And maybe consider giving it as a Christmas gift to neighbors and friends. Um, I, know, I know this is what some people are doing, have been doing actually since, uh, since the conflict started. Um, but even long before that, in fact, ever since Ukraine became independent from the Soviet Union, I think we do not necessarily realize to what degree our friends and neighbors are misinformed about what is going on in Ukraine. Just how efficient this Russian propaganda of uh, neo-Nazi junta is. It, it has a tendency to embed in people's minds and somehow they are able to influence public opinion. Um, now, fighting against this trend is an expensive proposition. Ukraine is in no position to create an equivalent to Russian television or Sputnik or anything like that. However, however, and especially in Canada, where so many patriotic uh, Canadians of Ukrainian background who wish uh, Ukraine to finally become a prosperous and democratic country, one way of doing so is actually fighting these small battles um, with, with some source in your hands. Uh, talking to your friends, talking to your neighbors, persuading them to write to the member of the parliament, if need be, um, giving them a book, a good book on Ukrainian history and contemporary Ukraine as a gift, any book, as I said, not, not just mine, uh, but a good one. Uh, the one which, which does not call for a compromise with Russia. The one which does not present the alleged neo-Nazis as the main force behind the Ukrainian revolution, while they are in fact truly marginal, and possibly sponsored by the Russian television even. So, there are private kind of small battles which we can fight by explaining things. And it's perhaps the most important thing for us. 
we within the field, uh, people actually lecturing and writing about it, are not necessarily aware of the power of neighborhood chats, uh, the power of uh, neighborhood Christmas parties, uh, the power of talking if you are a soccer mom, for instance, the power of talking to, to other parents while the kids play soccer. Uh, we can change our society's attitude one step at a time. And it's, uh, I think, especially important of those uh, living in the United States. But what I'm going to say is this. A single trip to Ukraine tends to clarify a person's thinking once and for all. Not everybody can make it, but we can do produce very good documentaries. Uh, there is a very good Ukrainian-Canadian tradition of making and distributing documentaries about Ukraine. This is also being done elsewhere. Ukraine itself is now making an effort. Uh, they do make an impact because they tell story in terms of human interest. They make the viewer identify with, you know, this crying woman uh, who explains what is, in fact, happening. There's also, of course, this stop fake movement, as you know, right? This stop fake movement, which is no longer applicable only to the Ukrainian case, but, but more globally, because, of course, the Russian media lies completely. And, and I find it personally actually very helpful to look up on YouTube one of the first uh, uh, press conferences, actually interviews by the newly elected French President Macron, when he speaks directly about what is the freedom of the media and what is propaganda. And also on Putin's very first visit to Paris, Macron made a point during the joint press conference of actually addressing the issue of Russian media's lies about his country. And I think that should be repeated uh, every time. It should be playing constantly on your YouTube channel to show it to everybody around because it is recognized, of course, these days by the British government as well, which is taking con countermeasures against the Russian propaganda. And it is and on folk and other statements by Canadian officials too about it. So it's not a lie that Russia is telling lies. Russia actually is telling lies. And once that is established, it would be actually very helpful to show a good documentary, uh, to, to, to send a good journalist to Ukraine, and so many good journalists were, in fact, uh, and now our foreign affairs in Canada are run by a very good journalist who repeatedly went to Ukraine as well. Uh, so it is, it is the issue, I think, of uh, uh, seeing it as personal experience, as a human interest story, but also establishing the fact that Russia is lying. So once that is established, people kind of, this, you know, cloudy thinking gets more clear. People can actually look at what is, in fact, in documentaries and reports. And that is the moment uh, to, to give a Christmas gift of some Ukrainian books. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a great pleasure. I'm happy always to appear on your channel. You're doing a great job. Very important. Do